Okay, so uh, I'm just going to quickly run through uh, one of the example uh, experiments we did uh, before moving on to the next section, just because uh, I think this uh, one of the plots should highlight some of the points I was making earlier. Um, so this is the simplest experiment we did. So it's a completely analytically tractable model. So it's just a uh, some uh, jointly Gaussian uh, kind of latent variable model uh, where we know the uh, kind of marginal posterior on the parameters uh, of interest here. Um, and so we're just using this as a kind of uh, time model which has some of the properties uh, in terms of the particular estimate we use of more general pseudo-marginal problems while still allowing us to know something about the ground truth. Um, but also having some of the properties uh, of the actual distribution uh, which make uh, things like the kind of uh, asymptotic results for um, optimal acceptance rates for Metropolis Hastings uh, valid within this case. So in particular, um, we know uh, that we would say want to have an acceptance probability of about 0.234 for some uh, uh, optimal measure of a kind of asymptotic efficiency in terms of asymptotic variance per number of samples. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're going to use an important sampling estimator um, and compare these uh, four different algorithms, so the kind of standard pseudo-marginal uh, approach uh, using a Gaussian random walk uh, proposal uh, with step sizes chosen from some interval, the uh, kind of split APM Metropolis Independence plus Metropolis Hastings update uh, that I discussed at the beginning of last talk uh, with the same proposal as uh, the pseudo-marginal case, then uh, looking at both applying size sampling to the auxiliary variables, so using elliptical size sampling um, with the auxiliary space and then a metropolis hastening proposal in the Zs, and then metropolis independence uh, updates to the auxiliary variables and size sampling to the um, target variables. So uh, as a kind of one plot that summarizes the different results, um, so on each of these uh, four different axes, in green we have uh, the average effective sample size for the particular uh, algorithmic tuning parameter um, averaged across, I think, 10 different chains with plus or minus some standard error shown by the uh, filled area. Um, so that's the kind of these green curves. On the uh, orange curves in the three different instances of algorithms involving a Metropolis Hastings proposal in the Z space, uh, we have the average acceptance rate of that Metropolis Hastings kennel. So in these auxiliary methods, that's ignoring the acceptance rates of say, uh, this Metropolis independence kennel. It's just of the uh, updates to the Z. Um, and then finally, so in the size sampling case, uh, there is no acceptance probability. We always accept in some sense, um, but we still have this effective sample size um, kind of normalized by computational cost. So pair evaluation here means pair evaluation of the density estimate. Um, so the pseudo-marginal method, so ideally we're in a kind of regime where we think 0.234 should be the kind of accept rate we should target. And so a lot of adaptive uh, MCMC methods might try to vary, say, the step size parameter or a vector of step size parameters to try and get an acceptance rate of 0.234 or you know, some other target interval, say. Um, but we can see quite clearly that's never going to be the case in this pseudo-marginal case. So this is using a single important sampler in the single important sample in the estimator, so it's quite high variance. Um, and we can see however small we make the step size, we never actually are able to push up the average acceptance um, high enough. Uh, so this kind of weird effect um, on the left here, uh, I think is due to some sort of transient in the uh, chain at the start. Uh, with a very small step size, um, there being like an initial long run uh, of rejections, um, but it's, it, it's in itself kind of counterintuitive kind of effect. We would kind of expect as we set the proposal's uh, step size to zero, we should kind of arbitrarily increase the average accept rate if we make it small enough. Um, so in the pseudo-marginal case, we get this very noisy signal. So the acceptance rate would not at all be able to tell us where we should uh, choose the step size to say, uh, optimize the effective sample sizes per evaluation. If we look at just this very minimal change to 
that method. So all we're doing now is doing separate updates to the auxiliary variables of a Metropolis independence proposal, and then um, a Metropolis hastings proposal separately to the Z variables, but using the same parameterization in terms of the proposal step size. Now the picture looks kind of identical to the kind of canonical case we'd expect here. So that at an average acceptance, if we kind of trace across from 0.234 here, we're exactly at the peak in this effective sample sizes normalized by the kind of computational cost and number of evaluations. So if we were setting this proposal step size adaptively, we have a clear signal from the acceptance rate of the metropolis hasting step to do so. And that kind of makes sense. This step size affects only that metropolis hasting step. It doesn't affect this MI step. So we don't really want to kind of conflate those two, um, which is what kind of results in this noisy signal here. So we're able to, we'd be able to tune that quite well there. And actually, in this case, we can see even normalizing for the fact that we um, have two density evaluations. Um, so we're kind of effectively having to double up this scale for every chain iteration. Um, because we get much more frequent accepts of the moves, moves in the Z space, um, our overall efficiency is uh, like an order of magnitude higher than here. So this is a very toy problem. And these gains in uh, performance, uh, we've not really seen in more realistic problems where we've done a bit more tuning of, say, the um, important sampling estimator. Mm -hmm. But just to kind of show that uh, you are able to even kind of uh, modulo this factor of having to do these two density estimates with a very simple tweak to the algorithm, both get you know, easier to tune algorithms in terms of uh, adaptation. Um, but also actually sometimes improved efficiency. Um, so the slice sampling plot, uh, all we're doing here is changing from metropolis independence moves to elliptical slice sampling moves. Here we kind of see the overhead intrinsic in the slice sampler. So we kind of get a roughly factor two, maybe a bit more reduction in our kind of asymptotic efficiency here. And that comes from the fact that we're typically making multiple evaluations uh, of this density estimator for every slice sampling move. Um, which is basically saying that we're not always accepting the first move. So that suggests that uh, this metropolis independence move is, would reject uh, because it should be in some sense uh, reflected. If it always accepted, we would expect the slice sampler to always accept as well. Um, but that does kind of uh, decrease our overall efficiency in terms of um, the number of evaluations per effective sample size. And then finally, if we look at slice sampling in the um, Z space, and so this is a plot trying to highlight um, that idea of being relatively insensitive to that initial bracket weight parameter. So here, we're scaling that over um, the range 0 to 10. Um, and we can see that, OK, so for, if we set that bracket weight too small, as I kind of said, there will be this kind of linear increase in cost um, due to having to do that initial linear step out. So sorry, here I was using the a linear step out method. So uh, if I make the bracket too small, I will have a lot of density evaluations at the start to kind of step out my bracket. Um, but that's okay, that's bad, but you know, if um, it's, it's at least only linear dependence. But interestingly, if I do the opposite of if I'm kind of overly optimistic about my initial bracket width, there's a very slow drop off, and actually, this continues uh, fairly um, a long way. Um, beyond that shown on this plot in the kind of uh, efficiency um, way of having overly uh, confident bracket width. And that comes from the kind of exponential uh, decrease from this uh, shrinking procedure in the slice sampling. So if we set the slice, the bracket too wide, basically we end up uh, very quickly reducing down and still accepting. And because that reduction is in some sense, you know, exponential or geometric, uh, it's not too costly. Um, so we kind of get this logarithmic decay. Um, so that basically says, in some sense, we should generally overestimate our bracket width. But if we do so, you know, the difference between being here and here is not that great in terms of overall performance. And OK, so here we're not at the level of the optimal performance here. But we only actually reach that optimal performance for a relatively narrow range of step sizes. So for quite a wide range of step sizes of bracket widths, this slice sampling algorithm would perform um, comparably, or in some cases, even better than the Metropolis, Metropolis Hastings kernel. And we're not having to do any initial tuning to get that. We just kind of plug this straight in, other than setting this bracket width. 
So um, I'll leave the results at that because uh, it's probably more interesting to go on to the material I originally meant to talk to at this point. Okay. So this is also going to be a little bit disjointed because my slides are in two different files for this part. Um, so I'm going to quickly just give a little bit of an introduction to automatic differentiation. So uh, a lot of people will already be quite familiar with uh, these <coughs> ideas, but I just want to make it clear before doing a whole load of um, uh, presentation about uh, methods which fundamentally require evaluating lots of gradients to make clear that that's not too much of a um, imposition in terms of both uh, being able to evaluate these gradients given the given model and also the computational cost of doing so. Um, so what is automatic differentiation? It's just an algorithmic way basically of applying the chain rule uh, to kind of recursively compute derivatives uh, of functions which we define programmatically. Uh, people tend to talk about these two different uh, variants, forward and reverse mode. Um, we can kind of think of these as two different ways of uh, expanding out the, the chain rule. Uh, it's also links to uh, kind of ideas of adjoint operators and so on. Um, but the kind of key point from a computational perspective is we would choose one or the other um, depending on the dimensionality of the function we're trying to differentiate in particular its input and outputs. So if we have a function uh, which has n real inputs and n real outputs, then we can evaluate this Jacobian vector product, um, which will have dimension equal to uh, the output uh, dimensionality of this function, a constant factor of evaluation of the actual uh, original function. So when our if we were, say, wanting to evaluate the full Jacobian, which we could do by plugging in um, different uh, Vs for diff of different test Vs, um, if M was larger than N, the forward mode would be the more efficient way to do it because we could construct that whole Jacobian um, with just N forward mode uh, vector Jacobian, Jac Jacobian vector products and get the whole Jacobian at cost roughly n times uh, the cost of evaluating the original forward function. Um, and the constant, there are various roles. It depends how you kind of formulate the primitives you use uh, within uh, the particular kind of auto diff formalism you're using. But it's typically um, at maximum, say, a factor of six, often more like two. So basically, to evaluate, say, a single uh, derivative pass, you're looking at uh, a sort of a small constant overhead of just evaluating the function itself. More typically used in uh, combinational statistics and machine learning because this is the important one if we want to evaluate gradients of scalar functions is reverse mode. So here we can evaluate the gradient of some say scalar function with respect to all of its inputs at a cost which is just a constant factor of evaluation of f. Um, there's an additional kind of catch here that we have to store the full forward pass um, and then do a separate reverse pass. And so that has quite a high memory cost, particularly if we have uh, quite, uh, so in some sense, uh, recursive functions which uh, have a lot of intermediary computations within them. Um, and sometimes, actually, this will be memory rather than computation limited when we're uh, applying reverse mode. Um, OK, so I was going to go through an example, but given that we're running on short on time, I'll just skip to the actual. Thank you. 
Okay. So in the last half hour, uh, I'm going to talk about a slightly different kind of class of models than I've been considering so far. So it's going to relate to the stuff I discussed on ABC um, at the start of the talk, but I'm going to make some fairly strong assumptions about the generative or simulator model uh, that we're trying to perform inference with. Um, so you, unfortunately, because this is kind of we're using a subset of some slides uh, that I've given in a different talk, the notation is slightly different, but um, a lot of the uh, will be shared, but there will be a few different differences. So um, I'm going to kind of parameterize my generative model, similarly to how I did before in terms of um, there being some kind of fundamental uh, randomness I input by draws from a random number generator, which I'm going to wrap into this u variable. So this is a, a big vector in which I kind of stack all of the draws from, say, a pseudo random number generator in a piece of code. Um, but here, rather than, uh, say, saying that's all conditioned on a particular value of z, I'm also going to say the actual, say, parameters of my model um, or any other latent variables that I'm interested in uh, performing inference with are also generated from that u. And that just kind of boils down to actually in practice when we do things like uh, generative modeling, what we really care about is the joint model on z and x, not anything about, say, a conditional model on x given z. Um, and actually, uh, we will typically actually just uh, generate z from some simple prior, but z itself could be some complex uh, generative model. It doesn't necessarily need to have this simple form where we can evaluate the density of it. And so all we're going to assume is that here rho is a density rather than a distribution so that we can evaluate the density on those input random variables. And for now, we will just say that we have deterministic functions given a uh, stream of random inputs which will compute simulated say, parameters and observations or uh, outputs. And so I will call these two functions generator functions. Um, and these u variables that we'll generally refer to as inputs rather than uh, auxiliary variables here. So the kind of more general case I talked about is kind of corresponds to this sort of uh, directed factor graph with this kind of augmented deterministic node notation here. So we just take u's, we map them through to deterministic functions, which may share some sort of computational graph at some portions, but basically we get out z's and x's. Uh, we can kind of see of this as, in some sense, just defining some joint distribution on z and x's without assuming any particular factorization. The more typical kind of ABC uh, based in inference type setting would be to consider that we have some prior on z's, which is typically in, uh, simple, uh, something like sampling from a you know, normal, from a gamma, you know, uh, some predefined distributions that we have close from densities for. And then given those z's, we uh, sample x's. But if we just kind of think of the composition of this function uh, with z's generated using this function, we still get an overall map from the random variates which go into generating z's and those give, generating x's given z's. Uh, so these are kind of, this is a subclass of these models. Uh, sometimes this will have structure which will be useful to exploit, uh, but we can kind of consider this more general case. So the, yeah, the, the kind of, the class of models that I'm going to concentrate in this particular uh, part in the kind of remaining uh, 20 minutes or so is uh, what I've termed differentiable generative models. Um, so this isn't particularly standard terminology. It's just uh, the kind of best description I could come up with in terms of the properties that I'm assuming. Um, so we're going to make some fairly strong assumptions about both the inputs and the generator functions here. So I assume that all of the input variables are real valued. Um, and that, that also actually applies to the observed and latent variables. Um, the input variables have some density and that, we can, that has a, a gradient which exists almost everywhere and that we can evaluate. Uh, more kind of computationally demanding perhaps, but um, is that we also assume that we can evaluate uh, this Jacobian of the generator function and also that it's well-defined everywhere uh, across the measure on U. Um, for 
for this to then define some kind of marginal density on the observed variables, um, a kind of very uh, low level assumption would be that we need, need a number of degrees of freedoms in our uh, random inputs to be uh, more than or equal to uh, the dimension of our output space. If not, we're definitely going to be confined to some submanifold in the output space. Um, and there we need to be kind of careful about questioning whether it actually makes sense to, you know, say, talk about conditioning on arbitrary observations. So we, we could condition on some observation which has uh, uh, zero chance of being generated under the model, uh, or not even, we can condition on some set in space which has zero chance, because I guess every point will have zero measure. Um, so we're going to assume that the Jacobian basically has full rank everywhere to kind of exclude those uh, singular uh, definitions. OK, so um, yeah, to kind of come up with some concrete examples. So these are all very toy, uh, but to kind of give you an idea of the sort of range of cases where this, these sort of assumptions might hold. Uh, the first is very machine learning uh, motivated, so this idea of having some sort of generative model of an image, in this case a very uh, simple digit image uh, specified by, say, uh, some sort of differentiable network model. Um, the fact that there's a neural network in here is not really important at all. The key thing is uh, that will necessarily mean this model will be differentiable typically because uh, it will have been kind of trained in the first place uh, by propagating derivatives through it. And these tend to define differentiable maps between a set of latent variables and the outputs. Uh, so this was meant to be a video, which apparently is not working. But um, the idea is as we move around this space, we would have this smooth transformation of, say, this digit image in the output space. Uh, so we're kind of defining this smooth map. Uh, we could also imagine a similar thing uh, for doing in a slightly maybe closer but still toy example to being useful, something like uh, inferring a pose from a 2D projection. So we might have some prior uh, model of poses, um, which we would say specify in terms of some joint angles, the lengths of the, skeleton, the bones in the skeleton, and then some uh, camera parameters. We have, say, here a very simple model of projective geometry, which we use to generate the projected joint positions. And then our inference task could say be we observe some 2D joint positions. Can we infer a 3D uh, pose which is consistent with those joint positions? Obviously, that's in some sense ill posed. There will be a kind of continuum of joint uh, configurations which is consistent with any given 2D projection. But if we have uh, prior information about what a plausible pose is, we can kind of explore, given the constraint of our observations and the constraints implied by the prior, what the kind of posterior on the poses is. Um, OK. And then the final example, which is the one that we kind of discussed at the first part of the talk, is this idea of simulator models. Um, OK, so here um, it's definitely a fairly small subclass of simulator models that are going to be differentiable with respect um, to all of the auxiliary random draws which go into them. Um, but there are interesting ones, that, so things like simulation of SDEs, um, any model in which we, if we have a discrete time dynamic, but that underlying uh, transition operator uh, it just involves uh, differentiable operations, then the overall map from, say, you know, Gaussian variates into the Brownian noise process or whatever noise process we're having to the actual outputs we'll have will be uh, differentiable. So it's definitely not covering a lot of the cases which people tend to use. Uh, consider as being kind of prototypical examples in, uh, for use of ABC. So things like population dynamics models or you know, models in ecology and stuff, where often we have these discrete latent states. But there are definitely interesting models in a kind of more simulator setting which fall in this class. Uh, so we're just using a very simple SDA example here, uh, a predator prey model. Um, we can write that very simply in, say, Python code. And then uh, we could plug this into some auto differentiation package to get gradients through this. Uh, so here the u's are just a random number draw, so all of these calls to this random number generator object. The x's are the, the time sequence of states. The z's are, say, the four parameters of that SD model. Um, again, video's not working, but uh, this would show mapping smoothly between different states in the latent, so the input space to uh, simulated 
participatory population traces. Okay. Um, right. Okay, we've covered that bit. So we'll skip to uh, how do we perform inference? Um, so this will be a little bit of a rehash what I talked about previously about ABC, but it's going to be specifically considering kind of the geometric uh, implications of what we're doing in this input space that we defined. And particularly when we're considering this map between inputs and simulated outputs and latent variables to be smooth, uh, what conditioning on variables in the output space corresponds to in the input space. So in this very simple 2D uh, example, we have one observed variable, one latent variable. We condition on seeing x, the observed variable, is equal to 0 0.5. Now we want to perform inference. So what does that correspond to? Well, we want to evaluate uh, expectations with respect to the conditional distribution on the Zs, given that x is equal to 0 0.5. So the kind of the ABC approach is to say, well, maybe I don't really care that I exactly have my observation equal to 0 0.5. I'll say I could be within some uh, epsilon tolerance of that here equal to 0 0.1. Uh, a very simple uh, kind of multi color scheme I could then use is just generate samples from the joint distribution. So that's sample from the prior on Zs and sample Xs if we're in a kind of directed case. Uh, then only keep those samples which X lies within this bound. Um, and then use those to, you know, come up with some multicolor estimator of, say, uh, you know, here a histogram, but in general, some expectation of uh, the Zs. So, obviously, we had to put some epsilon tolerance there. We might want to make that smaller so that our distribution that we're approximating is somehow closer to the one we care about. Uh, we can see uh, that would be the case that we maybe get a more informative distribution here, but that we're decreasing the number of samples which will lie in this set if we kind of fix the prior samples. Um, and in this 1D case, this doesn't look too drastic, but if we imagine this is a high dimensional space, even a very small collapse in that epsilon uh, would kind of have an exponential decrease in the volume, um, and so you lead to a much smaller proportion of accepted samples, and then obviously we could keep doing that. Eventually, we'll get zero accepted samples. Um, so throughout that, I've been just considering the, the output space, um, but actually there's a direct equivalence uh, in terms of an operation we're performing in the input space. Um, here it's a little bit less clear what the kind of, uh, we don't have a kind of explicit form for the geometry of this uh, set which we're accepting points in, but we can implicitly uh, evaluate whether or not we're in it or not by just mapping, pushing forward through this G of X to the output space and then looking at the uh, simulated X value. And that implicitly defines here some uh, set in the input space corresponding to uh, points we want to accept um, with then some simple density that we do know, say this Gaussian uh, input density in this case across that set. So we can imagine, say, trying to simulate from a Gaussian uh, density confined to this bounded set with this kind of uniform kernel here. Um, okay, so as I said, okay, we've, there is a kind of cursor dimensionality issue here. Typically we use summary statistics to overcome that to some degree by introducing extra approximation. Um, okay. So to provide a little bit of a specific ABC intuition in terms of what's happening in pseudomarginal methods uh, and why in an ABC setting or more generally um, they can perform quite poorly. And this comes back to very much what I was discussing in the previous two parts. So what we do with a pseudomarginal Metropolis Hastings update is, um, oh. <laughs> if my, oh, it is working. Okay. We, make a small but effective move to our uh, Z variables. Here actually, Z is directly only a function of U1. So moving horizontally here corresponds to moving horizontally here. Um, but yeah, we make a small but effective update here. And then we independently sample the auxiliary variables used to generate uh, X given that Z. So here that would correspond to We've made a reasonable move here. Uh, we, if we just made that Z move, we would have potentially accepted it because it's quite a small step. But now we're just independently sampling from the kind of Gaussian marginal on this. Um, and unsurprisingly, once we look at that overall joint move, we just end up rejecting. 
and that just again boils down to this fact that we're doing something that we know is intrinsically uh, not what we typically do in an MCMC setting, which is making independent moves of some portion of our state, and particularly that those sort of auxiliary variables can be very high dimensional, so this can perform uh, very poorly in practice. So, yeah, we can kind of, as we considered earlier, look at uh, this kind of uh, approximate posterior that we get via using some sort of kernel function. Uh, if we look at expectations with respect to this approximate posterior, we get something like this. Um, one thing to note is using this reformulation in terms of these auxiliary variables, u. Um, again, we now just have some kind of induced joint density on u's, um, on all of the u's, uh, which defines implicitly the kind of posterior density on the z's. So if we can sample from this uh, posterior density on the u's given the x's, um, which would just have a density that we can evaluate, because we can evaluate rho and we can evaluate this k epsilon. Uh, it has some normalizing constant, but we don't care about that from an approximate inference uh, setting. Uh, so we could say, define some MCMC move on a density, on a distribution with uh, density equal to this value here. Um, then straight away, uh, we would be able to kind of define alternative metropolis Hastings kennels, or sorry, uh, alternative MCMC operators in a kind of ABC setting. So uh, we just, yeah, have this target, joint de target density on the U variables. Um, and then we could do something like slice sampling or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on that uh, resulting target density, uh, with the key point being that we're not going to selectively independently update just some portion of that uh, set of input variables. OK, so in the final 10 minutes, I'm going to kind of talk about uh, this slightly weird notion of what happens if we collapse epsilon all the way to 0. Does that make sense in any uh, kind of particular setting? And can we do inference in those sort of settings? Um, so <coughs> If we have assumed that we have this kind of smooth map, then actually the kind of pre-image of this uh, linear subspace corresponding to uh, conditioning, say, on the observations here, will be some smooth manifold in our input space. Um, the geometry of this could be quite complex. In some cases, actually, it may be a series of non-connected manifolds, and that's actually going to be a potentially key issue and the methods we're looking at, because then we'd have to kind of consider move, moving between those manifolds. But we do at least know that locally it would be smooth just from these properties on the Jacobian. And so we can imagine um, if we wanted to, say, do inference by moving around this uh, manifold defined implicitly uh, by this relationship in the input space, uh, we could kind of exploit that uh, derivative structure. So we know effectively how to evaluate the uh, tangent space of this manifold using the Jacobian to propose moves that would in some sense follow the kind of curvature of this manifold. Um, and we can kind of state that a little bit more formally in terms of what we actually mean by a conditional expectation when we're looking at it via this uh, kind of potentially non-injective function um, that we define it as the uh, integral of some test function with respect to a measure which uh, we define as having density with respect to the Hausdorff measure on this implicitly defined manifold. Um, so this result kind of comes from a generalization of the change of variable formula uh, used within uh, differential geometry. Um, so in a kind of more uh, general setting, it's called this coarea formula. But yes, uh, for kind of completely smooth manifolds, we could um, kind of consider this as some integration against a Riemannian metric. Um, but just in general, uh, the key thing to note is that if we were able to preserve this kind of area measure on the manifold um, and sample according to some density, which is computationally expensive to evaluate because we have to evaluate this Jacobian determinant. Um, but that is at least something that we can potentially do. It's not something that's intractable to compute. It's just potentially costly. Uh, then if we were able to uh, construct an MCMC move, which left the resulting distribution invariant, then effectively we would have a way of uh, asymptotically uh, 
uh, performing asymptotically exact inference in these sort of models. And as much as in a kind of standard MCMC setting, uh, if we converge to the resulting stationary distribution, we could then compute consistent estimators uh, with respect to all of, of this conditional expectation. Okay, so that's what this says. Um, so we need to have here, it's important that this density is with respect to not the normal Lebesgue measure on RD, but on the Howdos measure on the manifold. Um, okay, so the, the main thing to get about this is that this is imposing quite a severe con computational constraint that we need to be able to evaluate this Jacobian and compute determinants of it. That's obviously in general gonna be an operation which cubically scales in the dimensionality of our outputs. Sometimes there'll be structure in that Jacobian such that we can uh, ameliorate that cost somewhat to something that's quadratic. Um, but yes, this could be a cubic cost. So we're probably gonna be working in at most thousands of dimensions, uh, uh, not more, but this thing can scale up to thousands of dimensions. Um, and there's a lot of interesting problems that would kind of still fall within that. So the particular MCMC uh, kind of dynamic we use is again a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method, but a particular variant inspired uh, by the simula simulation of kind of constrained molecular systems. Um, and so there's been a lot of work done within the molecular dynamics literature on uh, coming up with um, kind of property preserving integrators for uh, various different Hamiltonian systems. So there's a kind of key property of symplecticness that we need uh, for an integrated Hamiltonian dynamic to kind of get some uh, nice kind of consequential properties out of that, of being measure preserving, uh, having various uh, preserved first integrals, um, also being um, a particularly useful property in the context of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods is if we have a symplectic integrator under some stability bounds on the uh, numerical discretization of that, of the kind of step size we use, we kind of have bounded uh, error in the Hamiltonian uh, over a trajectory. So generally, Hamiltonian dynamics will exactly conserve the energy. If uh, we're approximately integrating, we no longer get exact conservation, but we don't get unbounded growth. We tend to get this kind of oscillatory uh, variation in the Hamiltonian over the simulator trajectory. Um, so for these constrained dynamics, there are integrators that people have come up with to deal uh, with uh, these kind of nonlinearly constrained systems. Um, they're expensive to evaluate, but these again can be scaled to quite large systems. People do this with, uh, you know, massive molecular uh, systems involving you know, hundreds of thousands of degrees of freedom. They again are exploring a lot of structure there to make that a more tractable kind of sparsity in these Jacobians and so on. But um, yes, this is expensive, but just to kind of it, you know, emphasize, it is possible to do this at, on interesting problems at scale. Um, and even on a kind of desktop computer, you can uh, feasibly do this, like I said, into the kind of uh, thousands, even maybe up to you know, uh, 10,000 dimensions while still remaining kind of, kind of tractable run times. Um, so while I talk about very high dimensions, what I'm actually gonna show you is uh, in the first video that's actually worked, a two dimensional problem. So this is again that ABC example that we looked at um, in the kind of series of slides earlier. And so here we're using this kind of constrained dynamic to uh, effectively defined in this input space on the implicitly defined manifold. We're smoothly uh, moving on the manifold um, here, trivially, because uh, there's only one direction we can move, uh, the exploration is somewhat simplistic. We're just kind of oscillating back and forth uh, according to the kind of, there is both a forcing term from this input density, but also actually a term depending on the Jacobian determinant, which in some way relates to the kind of curvature of this manifold. But then if we map those samples back through this generator function, what we'd actually get are X samples, which up to some numerical error, so we can, there is some tolerance here effectively implicitly under the hood, uh, which we say some new iteration has converged, but we typically set that to say, you know, e 10 to the minus eight or 10 to the minus 12, so we're kind of comparable to other floating point errors we're gaining. So up to that sort of floating point error, we're producing samples which uh, have the X value exactly equal to the observed value we care about. Um, okay, I've got five minutes left, so. Okay, so, a natural alternative, um, just to kind of provide a counterexample that might seem a sort of simpler thing to start with and also that might be a lot cheaper to run, would be to run 
uh, a kind of HMC dynamic in the case in which we're not collapsing epsilon all the way to zero and we're using some sort of smooth kernel such that it would make sense to uh, define some HMC dynamic in the resulting joint density. So it needs to be a smooth kernel with kind of uh, support across real space, for example, to uh, avoid having to deal with, say, uh, reflecting at boundaries of uh, non-support. Um, so in this case, we'd have something that actually looks quite a lot like, say, an inverse problem. Um, in as much as the Hamiltonian is some uh, complex function of some input variables uh, modulated by some uh, Gaussian observation density. And then we could try and run HMC on that density, uh, which is kind of a relaxed version of the kind of uh, epsilon to zero case. And so this is very closely related to ideas from pseudomarginal literature, like pseudomarginal Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, by Fred Linston and Otto. And then it's also been slightly tangential, but in some sense, similarly motivated work um, from the more machine learning literature and things like applying HMC within an ABC setting, but here using stochastic gradient estimates. Um, okay, so the issue with this in practice is that because this dynamic is kind of not informed by the geometry of the manifold, uh, even though this intrin intuitively seems like it would be more efficient because we're no longer having to evaluate full Jacobians, just gradients, uh, we're no longer having to do some nonlinear projection to make sure we stay on the manifold. Um, depending on how tight we set that tolerance, typically what we will see is that we, uh, have, the, we have the kind of manifold embedded in our input space. And then uh, around that manifold, we have a kind of small uh, set which we think is basically plausible. Um, and if we define the kennel smoothly, then we'll have kind of some smooth, we can imagine this is a kind of a very narrow uh, smooth valley through space. And if we define some HMC direct trajectory in that space, uh, it will have this very uh, high frequency oscillatory uh, nature going back and forth across that manifold. And in reality, particularly as you scale up the dimension, this tends to mean that you have to use A, a very small step size because you're constrained by the kind of uh, most constraining direction in space, which also varies as you move across the manifold. Um, so, so, okay, the, if your tolerance is high enough, then this can become more efficient and doing the constrained, uh, constrained integrator. But actually, if your tolerance, if you've got highly informative observations, basically, and you want to respect that within your um, actual uh, inferences, then the constrained um, method, even though each individual iteration is significantly more expensive, can actually work out statistically much more efficient to employ in practice. Um, okay, so I've got zero time left, so I will follow, finish with just one graph. Um, so this is applying um, to a lot to Volterra uh, SG model, doing parameter inference, first using um, standard kind of pseudomodular ABC, MCMC methods, which unsurprisingly you're unable to get work with the full, I think uh, it's 100 time steps, so 200 dimensional uh, data here. Um, but if you project down to a set of nine summary statistics using things like auto covariances of the uh, time sequences, you can do uh, inference um, and you do get some sort of concentration of your posterior around the parameters. In this case, we know the parameters we use to exactly simulate the data is this kind of uh, trivial toy setting. So there's no guarantee that concentration around the uh, parameters here is uh, what we actually want. We don't have any true sense of what the posterior is, but at least uh, it's kind of reassuring. But um, we can now consider doing, uh, say, slice sampling or HMC, as we just covered. Again, we are, in this case, uh, we straight away are able to get away from being, having to use summary statistics. So we can now condition tractably on the full uh, data without summary statistics and still do uh, MCMC inference in a way that uh, is tractable to run. Um, so, you know, uh, that straight away is quite a nice result. We're not having to bother about uh, coming up with valid summary statistics, which are informative about our data. Um, if we collapse further and now look at the constrained HMC case, um, we get these much more tightly concentrated um, posteriors around the parameters we use to generate the data. Interestingly here, if we condition exactly on that same set of nine-dimensional summary statistics, 
we can see that in some sense they're very close to being sufficient. Um, that without the epsilon tolerance, they actually pretty much give us uh, the same posterior on these four parameters. Um, so that's kind of highlighting one thing that comes about in ABC methods is that we have these two levels of approximation from the summary statistics and the tolerance, and it's actually the interplay of the two, which really often leads to uh, a lot lack of um, informativeness about the, the parameters. Um, all of this has just been looking at you know, the actual estimated posteriors. Uh, I will end here, but just to highlight what I was saying earlier about constrained HMC potentially being uh, actually quite efficient in some cases. This is looking at effective sample sizes per time. Okay, we don't know this is geometrically ergodic. Effective sample size might be a fairly arbitrary measure, but at least in some sense, these did look like they converge to stationarity at least. Um, and given all those provisos and actually that we're targeting different distributions here, so it's also somewhat uh, dubious to compare effective sample sizes across those, we still see that we constrained HMC gets consistently uh, higher uh, statistical efficiencies um, than even um, the fairly uh, poorly constrained uh, ABC HMC cases. Um, so this is using a fairly large tolerance. And that, uh, so we're both getting tighter posteriors in some sense and doing it more efficiently. So it seems a kind of win-win situation there. Um, okay, so I will just finish there. So yeah, this uh, I kind of uh, mentioned collaborators at the start. This was mainly work with uh, my PhD supervisor, Amos Stocky. Um, and all of this, if you're interested in reading any more about it, is available as a, a, an article called Asymptotically Inference in Differentiable Generative Models. Okay, thank you. Uh, it can be either, so you can uh, you can choose to work in. Uh, so it generates in the observation space, but you can kind of you, you end up with the, the your your Jacobian is a rectangular matrix. We generally assume that the Jacobian is uh, full row rank, such that it has there's fewer outputs than inputs. So it would always generally make sense to do it in the output space. Um, but yes, it's it's only linear in the dimension of the input space, which is quite nice if you have, if you're in a kind of inverse problem setting of very high dimensional inputs, but low dimensional observations. Correspondingly, this would scale better compared to something like Riemannian manifold HMC, which scales cubically in the input dimension. Um, but it still is, it's a fairly hefty cost if that output dimension comes high. So yeah, like I said, we did run this in examples up to a couple of thousand dimensions, there the linear algebra operations do start to become a bit of a bottleneck, and if you push that further, then you, but you can tractably, say, do a matrix inverse up to, say, 10,000 elements on a desktop computer within the order of seconds, so. And the, uh, would the integrator also keep you in the manifold? It keeps you exactly on the manifold in up to some machine error tolerance. So it's the kind of iteration you have to do at every step? Yes. Um, Yes, uh, so again there is, it's effectively, um, it's kind of hidden away somewhat because um, it's sometimes considered a separate from the actual integration steps itself, but there is some kind of implicit update effectively when we're solving a nonlinear system to uh, project ourselves back onto that manifold. And so generally that's done with a Newton iteration that happens to be for the constrained case, and this is again coming out of uh, results from molecular Dynamics, a very kind of efficient quasi-Newton iteration, which uh, uh, converges very quickly in practice and is quite stable. So that's what we use in, in the actual experiments. Um, but yes, you're having to do this at every iteration. So that's what I was kind of getting at when I was saying that. That's why it would seem naively that simpler things like using HMC uh, in the kind of kennel softened density would intuitively seem to be a better bet. They, they don't mix well because you're not, yeah, you're not using, you're basically exploiting extra information, geometrical information in the constrained dynamic because you know about this manifold, so you know you, your momentum uh, isn't kind of moving normally to the manifold, it always moves tangentially. So it, it does help. 
Yeah, well, that, ideally anything in a cheap way would be good. But yeah, this it's definitely this is a costly method, but it just works out if it's a very hard problem where you're very you've got a very uh, highly concerning likelihood. Then uh, this is kind of in some sense independent to the if you've got Gaussian likelihood to the standard deviation of the Gaussian. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think that is a potential. That one of the, I'd say that one of the main problems with that is that most of the problems people kind of use as prototypical examples in ABC aren't differentiable. So there are a few which fall into this class. So actually, David not talked about this Blowfly example, and I actually had to go after you talked. You talked about that coding up, and you can run constraint HMC in that, and you do get uh, you know fairly decent inferences. But the kind of there is a very uh, kind of narrow overlap between what I've termed differentiable generative models here, and I think models that most people who look at ABC are interested at. In.